Okay, um, everybody, thank you very much indeed for coming to the IMO today. Um, we're doing something a little bit um, dangerous. We're doing a, a sort of hybrid uh, online as well as in person. I always get a bit nervous about this. I remember doing one for London Shipper Week with, with Her Royal Highness Princess Anne and we forgot to record it, which, which frightened the hell out of me. But anyway, <laughs> these things happen and you've just got to go with it and be confident. Um, <clears throat> so the, the debate today, um, just a bit of housekeeping first of all, um, will last about scheduled to last an hour and a half these things um have a bit of a life of their own um they'll either go on for an hour hour and a quarter or we're reining it in and telling people to stop asking questions because we're all in the toilet we need some we need some coffee or whatever um so we'll see, see how that goes um there aren't i mean i'm guessing from from um no comment from kuba there's no planned fire alarms today um if there are um i guess just go down the stairs and, and, and assemble downstairs uh, by the entrance. Um, you'll see from the screen behind me, um, we have well, we have the, the, the three three panelists here in front of you. We also have, um, we have Rene um, uh, Covered Olson, CEO of V Group, um, dialing in from Dubai, which is excellent. And we also have uh, Andrew Dacey, <laughs> Managing Director and Group Head, Global Transport Group, JP Morgan Asset Management, who's dialing in as well. Um, the way that the process will work, <clears throat> um, you can see as an audience here, you can see um, all of us here on the on the panel. Um, when Andy or um, Rene talk, um, I'll then put the microphone down so you'll be able to hear, hear what's going on as well. Um, I'm delighted um, to also have here on the panel here, uh, Mark O'Neill, um, President of Intermanager and President CEO of the Columbia Group. Um, and I will sort of ask Mark if you just say, before we start to say a few little words of welcome as well as president of Intermanager. Uh, we also have uh, Sebastian Graf von Hedenberg, uh, chief financial officer of British Shortership Management as well. Um, little point out to the audience as well. This is an interactive debate. Um, I will be, if I could see you, <laughs> picking on people with, with uh, base tops or red ties or whatever uh, for questions or what have you. So uh, we've got some good, interesting um, subject matter to debate uh, moving forward um, and uh, really, really encourage you to, to take part in this. We also have delegates who've come in um, from all around the world and they're sitting in the, in the ether behind us all. Um, and again, uh, a message to all of them, please send in your questions. You've got a Q&A facility on the webinar at the bottom of your screen. You can also actually send a personal chat to the, to the panelists, to myself as well as the panelists, and they can respond personally to you. Um, please don't use it as a sales pitch to, to, to people. Um, very much the questions on, on, on the subject under, under discussion. But please send your questions in on the Q&A. I will fill them as well and then bring in, in, in responses from, from the audience. Um, the debate today is being recorded um, and we will sort of snazz it up and put it onto the um, uh, Intermanager website as well as we'll, we'll, we'll cover it within editorially within Ship Management International. Um, but without any further ado, Mark, can I just hand over for a couple of words of welcome from you? Uh, uh, look, I'll, I'll make this very, very short. We don't want to take any time away from the, the debate. A, a warm welcome to, to all of you. Time, the world is never a dull place for ship managers. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've dealt with COVID uh and now we have the the red sea challenges uh, facing us even more reason to come together as an association both of the the members and of the associate members very exciting time for us as well as we uh we've launched our general principles and now uh, as we agreed we need to get out there and uh sell them and tell the world all about them and why uh managers who abide by and adopt the general principles must um on, on any basis, uh, be better than those that don't, or, or arguably be better than those that don't. So an exciting time for us and a, a challenging time for us as we go into uh, 2024. Let's uh, let's have a really good debate and please participate from the floor. Well, thanks to Andy for uh, for turning up and uh, and Rene as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. If you can put yourself in place, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Right, the first question um, that we have on the debate today, we're, we're looking really at future-proofing quality ship management and why being one step ahead 
of the needs of owners and charterers is a necessity. There's a lot happening in shipping at the moment. There's a lot of issues under consideration, not only the technical aspects such as alternative fuels, decarbonization or and digitalization, all of those aspects. But of course, we're seeing major issues there as far as geopolitics are concerned, the Red Sea, um, the Black Sea, Ukraine, um, the China-Taiwan situation. There's a lot there that the shipping industry needs to take into consideration. Um, I'm actually going to really get people's views on this on this subject head of future-proofing quality ship management and, 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 and what it means. Um, uh, Sebastian, let me come to you first. Um, when I finish talking, if you can then unmute yourself. But, you know, what, do you, what, did, what does future-proofing quality ship management mean to you? Put yourself on. Yeah, thank you very much for for having me here. Um, I guess for for me, I'm totally with you. There is a put your put your microphone on. So, no mic on the front of you. On there. This one on. Yeah, press the blue one to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, clearly, there's a lot going on. Um, you uh, you named already a few of these items that present uh, themselves to us as opportunities, some also really as challenges. Um, there's a war and conflict. Um, there is decarbonization. That's actually where I would want to, to start. Having seen um, yeah, quite a number on, of you here on, on the panel uh, recently in Dubai at COP28, <clears throat> you will all be aware that um, the COPs in the future sort of divide defined the, the vision of decarbonization that is then supposedly complete by 2050, an uh, enormous undertaking. Um, and over the cup, last couple of um, yeah, years and even more so last couple of months, I think we all realized that these visions um, then uh, turned into hard regulation. Look at EU ETS, fuel EU, okay. Admittedly, this is just Europe, the rest of the world. Uh, we can and talk about that, but um, I think we as an industry, um, uh, from charters to ship owners to also us ship managers, took note and realized the, the significant amount of money on the table there. Um, and this is just EU ETS. So we went to Dubai to check in with the regulators. Um, there were some very engaging discussions. I think it's fair to say it was a courageous move to, to put the conference into Persian Gulf in the middle of the oil producing, gas producing countries. Um, yeah, and ever since, um, I can also say that um, together with Cuba and her manager, but also Anglo Eastern, RJ Hazari, I was part of the of a team that personally spoke to the regulators, the EU DJ, DG Climate. Um, after the first EU directive dropped on EU ETS, and we realized that the practicability of the rule set can probably still further be further enhanced. We started talking to them um, and found a, regulat a regulatory office that was willing to listen. Um, it is predominantly environmentalists. Um, there are so many different levels of communication with them. It's a different age group. It's uh, when shipping meets environmentalist it's not it's not automatically 100 percent aligned value set so it took some time to to get to know each other and i think it's fair to say that um the understanding on the regulatory side mm. about what shipping does the task basket allocation inside shipping what is a charter what's a ship owner what's a ship manager um i think it's fair to say that their understanding of shipping could could be uh, further improved in the process. So um, I would put decarbonization as a massive challenge here for, for the purpose of, of the debate. There's hundreds of millions, if not billions of money on the line. Uh, we're looking at the first rules and regulations. We are all working on them um, as we together try to find a way to practical implementation of these rules. And yeah, with that, I think I... Okay. I mean... Um... Looking at the, the issue of the quality ship management and actually making sure, I hope you can all hear me, making sure that in-house third-party management can actually 
um, meet up meet, meet up with this to Mars that's going to be, be pressed on it in, in the future. Um, how can quality ship management be future proof, though, on this, Sebastian, in the sense of what, what, what does that sector need to do now? Because it is about working with, with the industry at large as well on all of these issues that you're talking about. Yeah, just to follow up, I think we have a crucial role to play um, in BSM. Our, we have yeah, 650 ships in management, 450 in full management. Of those, about 250 regularly call the EU. And uh, we have specialty t specialist teams. We invested heavily, built the knowledge base on how to navigate this new regulatory landscape that is EU ETS. So um, depending on who the owner is, we have a number of owners who are not yet that familiar with the with the topic. And as we know, it's financially very, very exposed. So yeah. um, I think we can play and we must play an absolute crucial role in helping our owners from their negotiations with their charters to the registration and the registers. We, we can do a lot to keep our owners safe in this time. And I think to round out what I had in mind, it's far to say that's our mission. We are there to ensure safe and compliant vessel operation, competitive OPEX, high vessel availability. And if we fail helping assisting our owners on the, the UETS, they will have, uh, they can have the one or the other can, can really have problems. Andy, let, let me bring you in on this um, now. I mean, look, looking, you know, you, you, you're a major ship owner, uh, you're using um, outside management companies as well. You know, when it comes down to, you know, what, what is on your agenda and your dashboard when you're looking at working with, with managers and quality managers and as far as that future relationship is concerned? Yeah, sure, Sean. I mean, I think, as you said, I'm here in the context of the client as opposed to the ship manager. Uh, I, I think the future favors size which I think is both an opportunity as well as a threat to ship management. I mean, I think ship management still is a relatively small percentage of total ship management activities across the shipping industry. And <clears throat> the vast majority of ship owners still have in-house ship management. And so I think there are opportunities that the third party ship management world has in terms of moving that ratio more favorably in their direction over time. And when I say favor size, all the things that we're talking about, fuel transition, decarbonization, you know, we didn't mention cybersecurity, we didn't mention potential increasing autonomous aspects of ship activities that will probably come into the fore as, as the future unfolds. All of those things are quite complicated, they're quite technical, and clearly, I think as everybody in the panel and certainly everyone in the audience will recognize, being a small ship owner and confronting these challenges is, is not an easy task. So for the small ship owners, which probably are not favored, given the fact that all of this is coming down the pipe, uh, the third party ship management business provides a very unique opportunity for them to tap into a resource base, into a level of sophistication that they just won't be able to achieve on their own. And uh, as Sebastian was mentioning, just in the EU ETS example, you know, just, just tackling that one small component or facet of a very multifaceted series of challenges, I think ship management can help. So when, when I now I'm in a bit of a different situation in the sense that we are quite a large ship owner. We have collectively almost 150 vessels across a variety of different verticals. Uh, but we found that you know, having ship management allows us to, to grow more quickly, uh, to enter an area that perhaps we haven't been in previously and sort of ultimately achieve that level of sophistication and complexity that we just can't build out overnight. Uh, so I think being nimble and partnering with ship managers allows certainly small ship owners, but also large ship owners to, to expand beyond perhaps their key areas of, of, of compatibility or capability in the past. Uh, but I think the, the real challenge is going to be for, for ship management to continue to communicate its uh, ability to align with the ship owner. And, and I think that's where I've always found the biggest challenge, which is no one takes care of your ship. Maybe the panelist will, will disagree with the statement, you know, better than yourself, right? You're you better to live in your house rather than have it with a renter. And even though you might have a good renter, they, they probably won't take the same level of care. So how does a ship manager communicate that they're going to take care of your asset as efficiently and effectively 
and with the same level of focus that that you have in, in taking care of your own asset. And so, at least from a, a large ship owner's perspective, my my vision is, uh, you know, creating those those alignments and those partnerships that are certainly tested over time that can prove to both parties that we as the owner are there to support the manager, but at the same time, I want to get that that focus and that connectivity that I would expect of my own people uh, from the third party ship manager. So I think that, in my opinion, is is one of the biggest challenges going forward. And while I think the small ship owners will be a, a more easy target for ship third party ship management, uh, it's that partnership that I see as being a critical uh, vision of the future in terms of creating that alignment. So that, that's my thought about the future of ship management. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Andy. M Mark, I think you wanted to make, make a comment. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thanks, Andy. I mean, I think some of the things you you, you said there perfectly match what what I was going to say to this particular uh, point. I I with respect disagree to a point with what Sebastian said because um, I don't think it's for the ship manager to be out there to try to solve all the world's problems. You know, we are we're a service provider. Um, we have to be client facing, and if our uh, client is a small client, unsophisticated small client that wants to tap into the resources that Andy was talking about, then all well and good. Uh, and, and we should uh, keep our ear to the ground as to developments and try and advise the client on that. But but uh, uh, a lot of the bigger owners are of a sophistication level that they're perhaps more appropriate to have that sort of engagement at COP. Uh, at the COP meetings uh, rather than ourselves. So I think uh, fundamentally we're talking about future-proofing ship management. That's the, the, the debate. And future-proofing ship management is to ensure that we remain relevant uh, to our clients and our clients are changing in the nature of what they do. And they're not only relevant, but compelling. So they actually have to use us because we have that suite of services and, and we have that uh, the resources uh, available. So I think uh, staying relevant and compelling, aligned and in partnership, albeit in different models to the traditional third party management is um, really, really important. I don't think we as ship managers should be leading the charge necessarily on some of the issues of the moment such as alternative fuels such as digitalization because i don't think those issues are sufficiently well developed or mature enough for us to be advising our clients to take that if we take alternative fuels should we be going out to telling all our clients uh, to go for ammonia or go for hydrogen or, or go for, uh, for for methanol no we shouldn't but we should be ready and nimble and able and informed to do so uh, as and when uh, as and when needed so i think uh, uh, you talked about being one step ahead of owners and operators i think if you take the surfing analogy it's as dangerous to be too far on the front face of the wave as too far behind we need to be right on top of that wave so that we can react in any way and and let's take alternative fuels if we were advising our clients to go down the methanol route or go down the ammonia route and uh, uh ex-president trump comes in and and his motto is drill 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 and we we take a massive step back is that have we done our clients a service no we haven't so be ready be nimble be agile um i'm a big fan of um heartbreak ridge where uh you know the clint eastwood's there in a trench when the bullets are raining down on him he says improvise adapt overcome and i think I, I think that's the second marine corps uh methodology of winning a battle well that's what we have to do we have to improvise adapt and, and overcome it whatever challenges uh, we we might face and be client facing do what the client wants the particular client not a not a commoditized service but what the particular client want and needs us to do rather than going out there and trying to save the world because that's not the job of the manager it's not the job of intermanager brilliant mark you can put yourself yeah. on, on on mute there um andy okay. do, do you have any other comments on that andy just coming back on that yeah i was just i was just thinking that it almost strikes me that there's there's two steps here that perhaps can be relevant. One is the daily blocking and tackling of, of running a ship, which is clearly why we, as an owner, will go to a ship manager. But but this whole suite of other aspects, and whether you're pushing or reacting, you know, being proactive or reactive to fuel decarbonization, et cetera, I think that a ship manager, at least as I think about it, would be 
well served to almost have a two pronged approach to a client, depending on the size of the client. So I got to take care of my ships and make sure they're running efficiently and safely and the crew is safe and well taken care of. But at the same time, I'm still grappling with all these other issues. So it's almost as though you would have a, a two pronged client relationship. You'd have an individual that would be representing all these other issues that perhaps wouldn't be the same individual or group of individuals from the ship manager that's speaking to the shipping shipping owner uh and that and that sort of higher order future development aspect could could be a, a an active dialogue between a, a a group of specialists within the ship manager that can provide that engagement because making sure your ship gets into and out of the red sea is one thing but then making sure that you're at least thinking about the right issues, whether or not the manager is giving you the solution. Uh, I think all the significant depth that a ship manager can bring to the table would, would be well served by having the right delivery mechanism to an owner so that I can call up one person and say, I'd love to talk about ammonia or the impact of methanol or all these types of issues. So, um, so, so maybe, and, and I'm not sure what, you know, the team here has in terms of how they deliver their services to their clients, but, uh, but having that type of group, I think would be quite good. Rene, can I bring you in and thank you for, for being patient there um, to just really what your thoughts are, not only on the sort of the future proofing aspect, but from what you've been hearing so far, what, what, what are your thoughts and perspectives? Maybe I'll just patchwork uh, my thoughts in uh, and they will be uh, sort of uh, replying to some of this um, debate. You want a debate, Sean, and I think you will, you will get it. So I, I agree and I disagree um, with, with a lot of what has been said. But let me give you my take uh, on what we try to solve for um, in, in the current uh, world. So uh, to size, there are 65,000 sort of commercial ships out there. Um, the the average ship owner is four or five um, ships, um, and you have just under two million seafarers. Um, we know that shipping is going through uh, a whole suite of changes um, on the asset side, uh, and therefore these sixty five will have to be thousand will have to be changed over the coming period. Um, whether Trump uh, goes for oil and gas drilling mark, uh, which 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 may be in his right. Um, you'll need to change the world. I mean, that, that, that's it. So uh, all the, the, the current product tankers will have to find other things, probably liquid, to sail with. So it doesn't really matter. But, but from, a, from an overall global perspective, we need to solve this shipping or not shipping. Um, so that, that's going to come. The 2 million seafarers needs to be trained um, to be able to handle ever more complex um, aspects on the ship including digitalization. You have low orbit satellites coming. Um, so I predict within the next sort of 24 months, you will have Zoom calls like we do here with captains um, in, in the middle of the Pacific. That's happening. And to Andy's point, more and more automation, la -di -da, di da So it's changing fast. I do not believe there has been more complexities in shipping um, uh, in our lifetimes. I mean, the last big change to the assets was the double hulls and the double double hulls. So this is only going to take more speed. Um, regulations, they are scrambling the institutions, to your point, Sebastian. So they will continue scrambling. Now, ship managers and, and, and you know, our lesson did. So if you look at, to your point on scale, uh, Andy, if, if you look at um, what is it a shipping company is doing, um, they are buying the right assets. They are chartering the right asset out to, to deliver a product. Uh, how they deliver it, I'm not so sure uh, that that's the lesson of, of a ship owner. It just has to happen seamlessly. Uh, so so uh, I came from a ship manager, from a ship owning background. And, and I think it was a given that we could run ships efficiently. Um, but it was not a given that Walmart was transacting with us when I was on the container side. All the big ports want to transact with us when I was on the Detroit side. So I think ship managers is exactly that. We need to find solutions and at scale. Uh, yes, we are delivering customer service and we must do that at, to the best of our ability tailored. But if we cannot do it within, within the same sort of premises, the same processes, and every client is different, 
we will never be able to work at scale and we will always be in a commodity trap market. So we need to figure out how to, to, to deliver uh, our services you know, as consistent as possible within the, the confinement of cultural differences. Um, and then, of course, if you have real size like you, uh, uh, Andy, you would be able to command bespoke solutions and, 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 and great for that. The four or five ship owner will not, but we will certainly be able to deliver uh, a much more cost efficient um, uh, solution um, and have redundant capacity around the world. I think that is exactly where Shibona should work. So on the decarbonization agenda, absolutely we should have our uh, solutions. Absolutely we should be able to give them, our clients, perspectives on how should they think about alternative fuels? How should they think about how that will impact their propulsions and their asset management? But of course we can't put money in steel and we shouldn't do that. Uh, but if you look at the data that each of our ship management companies are producing, uh, we will have terabytes of comparable data on how engines are, are, um, are delivering. And therefore you would, you would be able to help our clients consider what kind of retrofittings should they consider in their asset planning? What kind of, of, of potential fuel will work for them? If you look over asset classes, of course, the container industry, which is more business to consumer, or the leisure industry, which is directly business to consumer, they'll have to change. They'll have to go head on um, simply because they're, they're demanded by, by the clients. Um, the, the liquid energy and the, and the, and the dry um, will have a little bit longer time, even though they'll have to get cracking. Um, so I think we can we can work at scale. I think it is for the ship manager to prove that we can make a difference that matters. We cannot expect ship owners to come and, and, and do that for us. We need to get out of the commodity trap. We can do things at scale. Uh, we are definitely digitalized. Um, ship managers have some of the best shipping systems in the world. Otherwise, we couldn't we couldn't do what we are doing. And then, of course, there are differences between us. I mean, some are pure ship managers, some are, are more integrated shipping companies, and so on. So we all have our different strategies. But ship management, as a core, um, should grow. And the last thing I want to say is that I also believe that we are on a generational change. The complexities in the world is just going mad. Um, I don't think in our lifetime on this screen, we have lived in a more insecure world with as many complexities as we are seeing right now. So we need to adapt to that um, and we need to ensure that, 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 uh, that we can service um, our, uh, our clients uh, uh, accordingly. Um, and I think, I think you know, ship management that can work at scale is exactly that. <clears throat> Brad, before I uh, bring in Mark, I know Mark wants to say something. You know, just you know, shipping is fragmented. There's a lot of issues going on. You've got the big players, you've got the um, the leaders, you've got the laggards, you've got. I think Andy was talking about, you know, the smaller ship owners. The industry is very, very fragmented, uh, and there are going to be challenges and there are going to be blockages to all of this. But what, what do you think are the areas that we need to concentrate on as an industry? Because you know it's okay with with the, the, you know, the companies that have got the resources and the money behind them to actually start to put these processes in place. But what are the blockages to this all happening? Would you say that we need to overcome? Well, yeah, no, I, I think working at working uh, um, at at quality every single day. I think the, the quality of shipping and not not being fooled into a commodity trap. I would be brutally honest. We we will have had clients uh, historically. We probably have clients today still. That wants to 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 decide this is exactly how we run it and not a not a penny more and and we will have a, a, a penny conversation that's not good for the industry we, we've been then kept in a commodity trap where well call a ship manager if you want to do it for 70 70 cents a dollar that's not the way to operate uh, and so we need to end his point he said well my my perception is that uh you know maybe i can run it better because it's mine it shouldn't be like that uh, we should be able to be qualitatively measured on the fact that we are running and a ship as good as he or better the day that he decides to trade it or the day that that, that a charter that really wants to, to have a, a, an agreement with Andy would take it and say, I, I close my eyes because this is one of the ship managers who is running it and they're doing it at scale uh, and I can look up 
exactly where my ship is and where it's trading, and I can get benchmarks from other from other uh, vessels in in the same category to know that I'm there. That's where we should play, um, and then be measured on it. Um, so that's where I see the industry from a ship management should go. That 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 don't race us to the bottom. Actually, measure on, on what we are delivering, also on the capex side. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rene. And and uh, we're now going into the general debate now. So please, also to the audience, and I'm I'm guessing you can hear what's going on quite clearly. That's good. Stick your hand up. Also with Rene and with Andy, because you're online. If you want to just butt in, stick your hand up, and I'll um I'll, I'll bring you in on this. But Mark, you've you've got a yeah. No, I, I I just wanted to say in line with what Rene said we have to do more and better than the owner and more and better for less so it's it's that for less too so that they achieve that scalability but this this debate is about future proofing ship management and, and i think it would be wrong for us to sit here discussing that without thinking about what what ship management looks like in the future because we're in an industry which is undergoing huge transformational change we're an industry that is consolidating we're an industry that's digitalizing we're an industry where um some of the traditional liner companies are not calling themselves liner companies anymore they're calling themselves logistic companies and they're buying airlines and they're buying trains and they're buying uh, haulage companies and and is the the word ship manager going to become a misnomer uh, in two, three, four, five years time. It's definitely at some stage, uh, be, being a ship manager will not no longer be relevant and certainly not be compelling. So I think, uh, you know, the ship managers of today not only have to achieve scalability and efficiencies and effectiveness, uh, as we've just discussed, but, but also develop that integrated platform of services. Uh, we've been using that uh v ships is using that bsm i know is 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 the, is is the same become that integrated platform of services so that the client uh whoever that might be in whatever shape is able to utilize and has to utilize our services the client may be an asset owner maybe a train operator maybe a plane operator maybe a, a vessel operator but it's all got to it's all going to be integrated and we somehow have to fit into that mix and offer our services and manage those assets and optimize the operation of those assets so i think uh, it's a big challenge uh and i think most of the uh, companies certainly the ones on this panel are going down that line um but andy and and uh, uh his company in the future will expect us to be able to deliver on all of those uh on all of those bases and uh that's what we'll have to do brilliant all right lovely mark you put on mute um andy you got your hand up um give, give me your thoughts i think i just <clears throat> wanted to make a quick comment which um and I, and I agree with with most of what's been said, but I think Renee was mentioning that we have what's it sixty five thousand ships and two million seafarers. Every every ship manager, well, large ship managers like the ones we have on the panel today, are basically some of the largest shipping companies in the world. So they'll have more access, more exposure, more involvement with a broader range of ships than than only the only comparable ship owners will will be only the very largest. So uh that that's exciting because if i were a ship manager uh i would see that with sixty-five thousand ships that maybe not all of them but a significant percentage of them will need to change in some form in the coming decades uh, there are a few organizations better placed to be involved in the nitty-gritty of that transition than a ship manager uh so just by virtue of what you all do you're going to have so much information and so much data that if you efficiently communicate that to your clients, clients will will just want to gravitate towards you. Now the delivery is critical, and and that's more the finesse of of your business and how you how you, you create it, but uh, and deliver it. But um, but I think it's a huge opportunity. And uh, while there are challenges, you know, I would uh, if I were running a ship management company, and I'm sure you all do, sell these strengths. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, Andy. Um, Sebastian, let me bring you in then, Rene. Um, I'll go on. Yeah, over to you. Yeah, I would agree with... with um, you put your microphone. Yeah, just put the microphone towards you. The, the, That's fine. Yeah. I would agree with, with Andy, and maybe we. it's worth making a bigger point out of, out of that. The the uh, complexities that we see in, in, in shipping, but also 
uh, from chartering to ship owning, ship management. That is that is um, typically good for for us ship managers. There are, as we discussed before, there's a, a number of ship owners out there that are not staffed to follow through with all these changes. So generally, complexity equals business opportunity for us. Um, and when we went earlier into the service deliveries as detailed as think about currently, we have people helping helping ship owners register in a register in in Netherlands that comes up with 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 weird uh, requirements. I, I must mm. be as honest to say that of course we charge for the service, so it's a business opportunity. But what um, I think we should all be very clear about is um, we cannot. Um, forget our core service delivery over it. Of course, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of new things. Management time gets absorbed. Uh, the time of our IT side is getting absorbed, uh, catering to these ever new developments. At the same time, we must be very, very cautious that our ship owner customers actually call on us to deliver a very solid um, core ship management service. And that is keep the crew safe, uh, we should talk about um, war and conflict also, maybe even in the context of sanctions here, keep the, the brand reputation intact of the, the customers, operate the ships in a compliant and safe manner, um, and provide the training. So we should never forget the basics as we are um, yeah, to a varying degree uh, enthusiastically embracing the future. Okay, thank you, Rene. Let me bring you in. And also, just before Rene says, you know, we've got we've got delegates sitting in on the webinar, so please send any questions you've got through to me. And also, this very quiet audience here. I, oh, good. Some hands are going up. I'll, I'll come on to you in a second after Rene. But Rene, over to over to you, sir. Yeah, I think is a is a is a You're great debate. Are you on mute? No, you're not. No. No, go so. ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, sorry. You hear me? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's great. And um, so um, this is exactly right. Uh, what you're saying, Andy, that 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 we are the, the, the largest. We don't own the asset, but we have the exposure. We have the exposure with the people. We have the exposure of, of running these assets. And we produce data and we give it back to our clients. But we should also use it to better the, the, the industry. Now, we are all, we're 60% of shipping that's it um, and i think that's because it has been commoditized over the years is raised to the bottom but also we had we had we had desperately great at at at, at, um, at cannibalizing within the 16 percent and so um for us to to get a grab at the big table um i i really really do believe that uh, we need to work better as an industry um, we don't need to each and one of us invent all the same services the same me too to to all of it yes we should say me too to quality we should say me too uh, to 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 being global uh, relevant and and so on and so forth and you're right mark there should be consolidation we are seeing some which is great but fundamentally we we need to agree on 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 digital platforms maybe not one but but maybe maybe more but but we cannot all keep cannibalizing within ourselves um, to get the bigger price um, we need to go broader, we need to go better, we need to uh, create platforms and partnerships. I grew up uh, in, 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 in AP Mola in the time where, um, you know, it was a race to the bottom uh, on, on liner traffic. And so alliances was created. Um, and so I think we need to think outside the box and, and, and figure out how how uh, are, are we able uh, without any competitive uh, uh, challenges uh, to actually better shipping and whether it's decarbonization is decarbonization whether it's digitalization is that or seafaring the things that absolutely don't have any whim of of, of antitrust situation um but but i think it's better for shipping and it's better for ship management <clears throat> So thanks, Rene, for that. I mean, and I think it is an interesting point that, you know, the ship management industry has an awful lot to offer, but you're still only managing 18 to 20% or 60% of the world fleet, you know, and, and that's across 500 third party managers. So um, I'm going to throw it out to the to the floor. Could I ask, gentlemen in the corner, could you put your microphone on, say who you are, Give the question. I'll then relay it just to the gentleman online, so we uh, we're all there. But yeah, over to you. Can't hear you. Okay. 
maybe just maybe just stand up and shout it or something. Don't trust. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's one down the bottom there. Yeah. This is the IMO bit of equipment that's not working, not yeah, ours. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Did you, Andy and um, Rene, did you get that question? Okay. So um, that was from um, uh, Robert Hodge from ITIC saying that um, with with sort of uh, ownership going over to to um, the Far East, to, to China, a lot of China owners there, they can managers now work on a lump sum basis as far as uh, the management side is concerned. But Mark, over to you. Look, this comes back. Uh, first of all, it's a good question, it, but it comes back to what we've all been saying, I think, is uh, we have to be client facing um and it all comes down to risk appetite we might be able to do that for or want to do that for a particular client a blue chip client and there's blue chip clients all over the world um we might not want to do that for whatever the opposite of a, of a blue chip client is and and uh you know i think as an industry uh i think there are very few that are more um risk exposed than chip management we take on a huge amount of risk for very very little reward and, and in fact anybody um looking at the outside would say why do they why do they do this for such little reward they take if something goes wrong we're hugely exposed um so yes we can change the model and we should change the model and we should look at every client on their own and, and get away from this commoditized offering um that 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 the Rennie was uh, agreeing with uh, agreeing with what we were saying on that get away from the commoditized option it may be that uh, you know it's it's a different type of partnership or it may be a different type of remuneration or it may be a different sharing in the upside of the vessel's operation we have to be open to every single model that makes sense not sacrificing the quality I think if you sacrifice the quality, um, then we are on an inevitable downward slope. And that is why, you know, these general principles are so important, because we haven't, you know, we haven't talked about that yet. You know, if we if we are going to attack more of the market, more of that, you know, we only have 16 percent of the, the, the shipping market. If we if we want to get ourselves up to 40 percent or 50 percent, then we're not going to do that by the race to the bottom that Rennie was talking about and trying to take vessels from each other. We have to get out there and persuade the market that we are uh, as good as they are in managing their vessels and we can do it for less and do it better. And that's why these general principles are so vital to us to get that message out there and at least aspire for better. Um, Mark, thank you very much. If you can put yourself on mute. Um, Andy, I want to just want to bring you in on that one point before I go to Sebastian. And I think probably Rene was trying to put his hand up and then we had little sort of sound bubbles coming up. Okay. Um, but, but Andy, you know, um, from an owner perspective, um, you know, what do managers need to do to make themselves more attractive to owners? And that's right the way across the board. You're talking about big owners, medium sized and small. You know, what is going to really jolt the ownership and the owners and the charges into saying, look, we need to actually embrace this type of um, management of our vessels? I think, as I was saying earlier, uh, you know, I, I think it depends on the type of the owner, the size of the owner, the level of complexity of the ships that the owner owns. Uh, so a small owner that has, let's say, three bulkers is probably going to have a whole different set of requirements, a lot more limited set of requirements than if you were to compare that to, to what we have, which includes LNG, LPG, dual fuel, not just uh, methanol, but also LNG dual fuel. So what, what and, and, and I was thinking earlier, uh, there's different types of service organization models in the world. And, and again, I 
don't spend a lot of time thinking about how ship managers deliver their business every day. But I do think for a larger owner like 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 myself, um, you know, and I think we'd be willing to pay for this as well is, is to have sort of, you know, call it a concierge team or something like that. I can't tell you how many times that I go through a week or a month and thank God I'd, I'd love to be able to just call one point of contact and, and get some download or some data. Uh, brokers do that for us. I can call Clarkson's or Arrow and, and they'll put together a package of information for me. Um, I think class societies do it very well. So if I need a deep dive on something, um, and I think that the vision of a ship manager is just, and, and I didn't hear the question, but you know, just delivering, uh, I think as, as, uh, as Renee so aptly put it, this, this commoditized service, um, you know, that, that's probably what needs to be gotten away from. And, and, and that's not to say that there won't be owners in the world that say, look, I'm gonna just choose on price and give me the best price. And if you can't give me this price, no matter what it does to the maintenance or the CapEx aspects of my ship down the road, then I'm gonna take that risk. Then, then, then maybe that's not the kind of business that the, the ship manager of the future wants. Uh, but I probably think you probably still have to contend with that and creating a product offering for those types of owners is gonna be important, but, but articulating why, you know, doing it the cheapest may not be the best in the long run. I mean, we all want to have it the cheapest, but we also want to have it the safest and, and also protect our investment. So, um, I mean, I, and the other thing too, so I, I just think, and as I said earlier, that partnership and that alignment, you know, convincing me that the same level of attention that I would give to my own asset is going to be given to the team that's focused on the day-to-day -day operations of the asset from the ship manager, that's super important to me. Um, and, and, but I was thinking, I, I think the question had to do with potentially also with some Asian, the growth of Asian ownership. And I think that's definitely going to be an issue going forward. And, uh, and I think that probably presents a whole suite of different challenges, given the geopolitical tensions that exist globally. Uh, and hopefully they don't, they don't increase between the West and the East, but, but if they do, then a, then a Western owner may be confronted with the whole series of potential issues as they try to deliver that service to a more increasingly, let's say, Eastern uh, ship owning community, but um, but it's hard to foretell what exactly is going to happen there. But but alignment and partnership would be what I'm looking for. <clears throat> Brilliant, thank you, Andy. I'm going to bring very briefly Sebastian, then Martin, and then Kuba. Um, I don't know, Kuba. Can we maybe have the lights up a bit? Because I can't really see the audience. I don't know if it, there's, there's... there is a commotion because we can't see the screen. So right. Okay. I'll try okay. And see that I can no problem. But um, Sebastian, let me let me bring you in. Yeah, I wanted to briefly circle back to to Robert, who who was asking whether we as ship managers uh, are generally open to to offer yeah to OPEX lump sums on top of crew crew lump sums, especially in the uh, Chinese Chinese leasing company market, where I think we all have sympathy for the leasing companies and their sometimes relatively rigid credit approval requirements so we're getting a lot of these questions are we willing to to offer um technical lump sums and um, securing more of the opex uh, with the with the light it's better and i can say for for ourselves we we put a lot of work into <clears throat> into this um over the years uh, we have not yet um found a single business that we found an attractive enough to do it because obviously if if the entrepreneur the ship owner wants to uh, outsource the downsize downside, they will have to outsource a part of the upside, a significant part of the upside um, to us as well. Nothing else makes sense. So for as long as it's um, very low OPEX budget ideas, part with a very low management fee idea, and the, the request is to offer all that package uh, as, a, as a technical lump sum, a crew lump sum from us, it's, it's a clear no. Um, however, we have sympathy for that type of customer. We, we like um, and we will continue to put put hard work in trying to find finally solutions that are um, uh, good for for that type of owner and allow us as industry then also to grow in that in that space. They have a lot of ships. Okay, lovely, Martin. Can you can you can I ask you just to come up here and ask a question here? It's just it's just with the technology that sort of probably makes it a lot easier. I apologize. Um, and Andy and Rene, but presumably Rene and Andy even hear what we're saying right. and everything's still okay. So okay. okay. Probably best to do it here, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for the sake of another four foot. Complexity has come up a couple of times, and to complexity, I was just thought we might 
we might uh, add no at the end of it. Uh, I think it's quite important to highlight the no because it is going to be a change in the way regulation is reviewed. And I think you might be interested in going to add to the regulation of the regulation yeah. and then with a perspective and now we're moving into a balance based future, which makes it a lot more difficult because regulations are becoming changed. So I guess the point I want to put uh, up to the debate is uh, how do we assess what good looks like? Because coming back to support and if you want to participate in the uptake, you need to have a performance based contract that both sides recognize and both sides can agree on. You know, while a consistent carbon intensity indicator is not that consistent indicator of what good looks like, and that's part of the reason why we see very little uptake of that in terms of you know clauses and, and introduction of that. So we've always had this watertight bulkhead between technical and regulated. And also, box partnering sides of the houses. And then obviously, this water type bulkhead has to come down in some way. So, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, you know, how do we get a better quality of conversation going between fake buyers and fake sellers? What does good look like? And, you know, realize that there are one size fits all. Now, with some of the work we're doing at the moment, it's going to be a consistent market construct to provide a reference point that the market can come with. So I guess my question for the panel is, is what does good look like and how do we describe it in a way that makes it possible to build performance based content? So there's always a reason, Martin, why I ask you to come up and ask a question like that, because there's no way I could repeat all of that. So I'm not really interested in that. Who wants to answer that? Who, who, who's, Mark, do you want to have a go at that first? Yeah. I, I think good looks different depending on what goggles you wear or what glasses you wear. And uh, I think the danger of any sort of KPIs does a, for instance, if we, if we take a, a manager that manages predominantly old tonnage, uh, that manager's record on, on uh, uh, right ship record or, or, or whatever other assessing agency is going to look worse than a manager that manages predominantly newer tonnage. And, uh, and, and therefore it's very, it's it's very dangerous to look at these external agencies and their ratings on 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 managers' performance. Of course, we all try and do our level best, but if you have a client that gives you a a, a rust bucket uh, and is not willing to pay for that rust bucket to be maintained and renewed, etc., then he, you can turn that down, or you can manage as best you're able and as safely as you're able. So good, it's a very it's very difficult to assess. You could be doing a great job with that rust bucket, but nevertheless. Um, incurring observations, etc., uh, uh, along the way. That is why. Sorry to keep harping on about it, but that is why we came when we formulated the uh, principles. We we adopted KPIs in those principles and set goals and made sure that those princi principles were aspirational, so that that the manager has to aspire to the principle uh, set out in this document, so that he or she can be assessed against those, whether it's a rust bucket or whether it's a squeaky new dual fuel um, uh, container ship or whatever it may, whatever it might be. And I think that's the way to do it. So where is the manager on that road towards quality ship management? A divorce from the asset and the age of the asset and the condition of the asset that, that, that they get. I think that's what good looks like. What is the manager doing uh, in the, 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 the role of managing? And uh, I think the principles, if they're adopted properly and if they're assessed and they're self-assessed and if they're externally assessed, will get us to what good looks like. Without that, and without the support of uh, clients like Andy that says, yes, I see that this is a route. This is a very valid uh, a method of measuring performance, then we're going to be, we're always going to be saying, well, you know, uh, this this manager is better than the other manager because they they they've got newer they've got newer tonnage. Very very difficult to to assess. Mm -hmm. If I may, just yeah. So, so I'm bringing Martin over. Martin Crawford Brunch. You probably all know Martin. But... We came to work with a working for that regional operation. So I do hope this is our next um, benchmark, but it can be a, you know, a, a way of demonstrating that you're improving, whether you start with a rust bucket or start with a good ship. Uh, brilliant. Um, Rene, have you got any comments on this? I mean, you know, uh, on this, you know, what, what 
good looks like. And I mean, and I think so Andy's made some very, very pertinent points. And it's good actually to have the owner perspective coming in on that. But what, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I couldn't hear any of the questions. I, I doubt Andy could as well, uh, us sitting outside. Um, and uh, But I, but I uh, um, just for the record, I, I seem to have some uh, invisible helper with those animations. So it was pretty cool. Um, I don't know where they came from uh, before, uh, but that was... Uh, that was uh, uh, chat GPT probably helping me uh, without using it. So um, I think Mark has, has mentioned it very well. We have to be very, very careful um, that that um, we are sort of institutionalizing parts of shipping which actually have, have, have difficulty being institutionalized as, as the only reference or the only uh, record of truth. Um, I think we need to be very transparent in the way that we are running uh, our business. Uh, we need to make data available. Um, we, uh, uh, from from our perspective, and I'm I'm sure I speak for for my compatriots in ship management that you know we we uh, we we can give client dashboards, which is basically uh, up to date um, um, as far as as far as at least the ship is online. Uh, in the periods where it can't be online because of bandwidth, then it would just get online um, subsequently the minute that it reaches um, the, the, the right spot. But basically, you should be able to measure us at any given time. On the rust right pocket part of it, uh, and I think that has been a parking place, uh, ship management for that in the past, and, and to a certain extent, it may still be. I, I, I embrace the fact that we can get uh, uh, older tonnage into uh, into ship management. Why not? Because we come back to the scale, we come back to our ability, we come back to craftsmanship. We should be able to bring it up to to uh, to the stage where it should be. But if we are held to the standard of what Mark called a rust bucket, we should we should never, as an industry, accept that. Um, and I think it starts by that recognition that enough is enough. We have pruned vessels in 2023, and we should probably have done it before. Um, so we hope that over the coming years we will get to a better place. But that doesn't mean that we would not we would not want to take uh, older assets into into the business. Um, but measure us on the outputs. Don't measure us on uh, um, on statistical tools that may or may not be befitting for the world we are living in right now, because the complexities of those uh, will will differ. Uh, but but demand that you can see the the, the footprint on on um, on your ship, and that should set you free. Brilliant. Thank you very That's much. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Rene. Um, just really a sort of note out to our uh, webinar participants, delegates. You're all very quiet there. Uh, any questions you want to whiz through, please please do. Um, there's a saying that we're, we're time flies when we're having fun. We've already been talking for an hour. It's amazing. Um, but uh, so we've got about 20 minutes to half an hour left. Um, but I want to come on to to another element, being the human element. And I think this Cuba. I do apologise. Cuba has a question. Do you want me over there, or can I keep mine? No, come over. Come from over here. I think really. Yeah. So we have uh, we have Cuba, and then we have John Faraclass speaking. So. Yes, good morning, everybody. Kuba Szymański, Secretary General of Intermanager. Now, uh, Andy, the question was really for you, and I would like to endorse this question. How would you feel about the uh, performance-based contracting? You are talking about partnership. How would you like to assess your ship managers on the based, you know, contract-based shipping KPIs, for example? That would be a question for you and for fellow ship managers here. Uh, why are you guys using 16% when actually Intermanager can show you that the best ships are managed by 45% by ship managers? What is very interesting, the statistics, that ship managers are actually drifting into the better fleets, LNGs, uh, newer tonnage, and so on and so forth. And you are obviously amalgamating everything and saying 16%. It is interesting, but what we need to do is this benchmark. And you guys are talking about transparency, but actually when we are going back to our members and asking for IMO numbers, asking for this data, we are not getting it from you. So we cannot even defend you, show that we are already pretty good. Ship managers are drifting, whether you like it or not, into the better tonnages. And Mark, when you are saying the rust bucket, I, I'm pretty sure from your own point of view, Colombia wouldn't like to be associated with the rusty bucket. So you're not... This is the 
Darwin here, isn't it? The fittest survive. They are going into the better markets because you can afford that. So two questions. One was for Andy, computer, sorry, the performance-based contracting and working together on showing how good actually ship managers are because we are. Thank you. Okay. Andy, did you, did you get that okay? I, I did get that, yeah. Uh, I like the, the name Rusty Bucket would be a good bar to go to. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you know, like on measurement, I think it's it's a nuanced point because, okay, it'd be great if I just threw up on a dashboard. I, let's say I have three ship managers all managing the same type of ship and one, you know, the daily OPEX is X, the other is higher and one is lower. Well, so then I would say, all right, the lower one's the best, right? Because I made more profit, at least in that year. But uh, I think there's a combination of potential errors of commission, which perhaps could be errors that a crew makes or, you know, perhaps, you know, the ship hitting the, a, a, a bollard or something like that, uh, which would be, a, you know, an error, a human error that I would be upset with. Uh, but there's also errors of omission and, and errors of omission I think take a lot longer to become apparent. And so you could, and again, this is, I don't think anything new of what I'm saying here, but I think it's getting the right KPIs. And then I think the challenge for the ship management industry is to demonstrate that a little extra money spent today is going to prevent a lot of money spent tomorrow. And I'm not quite sure how you do that. Uh, other than just regular communication levels of trust between the owner and the manager. But I, I don't think it's as easy as, as just going down to the bottom and seeing who's the cheapest. And, and, and I think that, to, to my mind at least, presents the issue. Um, uh, and then getting back to my other point, I think for a larger ship owner, you know, how do you deliver the full suite of services to the right decision makers on the owner, owner side effectively? And, and that just, I think it's a stylistic issue for ship managers to contemplate. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, just get your comments there, Mark, on this performance-based contracting there, and and um, and really the whole idea of the ship managers moving towards quality aspects. Uh, aspects, aspects. aspects. Yeah. yeah, I think I don't think there's any one of the ship managers on on this uh, on this panel that is afraid in, in any shape or form of. Uh, uh, being assessed on the quality of their ship management, and and uh, most of our sophisticated clients set us KPIs, which we have to uh, comply to uh, and exceed. And if if we were sitting in the ownership position, we would do uh, exactly the same. So there, and and in a sophisticated setup, there is some upside where we exceed those uh, KPIs. So so all well and good. Equally. Uh, it's not uh, any of our intentions to manage the rust bucket. The rust bucket comes with all sorts of reputational issues, and the rust bucket normally comes with a with, with an owner that, that claims he or she is paying us enough to manage that rust bucket and get it up to a standard for nothing. Uh, and that's not our job either. If we want to take over a rust bucket, then there has to be um, a, a certain risk allocation and we have to be given the means and the wherewithals to get that rust bucket up to a, a, up to a standard. Um, but uh, we've all been approached by the owners who will say, manage five of my ships and one of them is, is a bit challenging. And, and I don't really want to spend any money on that. And that's a very hard decision. Uh, that's a very hard decision to to, to take. It's, we, we'd all like to be in the position to reject those vessels. And uh, for the most part, we do. Um, but uh, as I said, we, we have to take the client as we find them. Brilliant. OK, thank you very much. Um, John, John Paraclas, you've got a question. Yes, uh, first of all, one question is uh, on the quality issue. I go back uh, about 25 years ago when Captain Cuba gave a presentation about the ship of the manager on the KPIs. And with my 54 years of experience in the industry, I would go if I had ships to give them to a manager who he or she has been at sea as a master and for those without any assistance around it. So what you do not know, you cannot control. So equally for my past uh, service in NATO, um, you cannot judge what my shooting is like when you listen to the host. Nothing like 
Okay. Okay, John, um, let me just um, let me just repeat the question because Andy and Rene wouldn't have heard that. Uh, John was saying that, um, you know, if he, John is from All About Shipping, um, which is on the media side. He said if he was uh, putting his vessels out to management, he'd be f preferring a manager who's been to sea, he's got that experience, master uh, chief engineer. I think that brings us on and, and, and in answer, and I'll ask your views on that. Um, but it does bring on that important issue of having that understanding, that empathy within your operations, within your teams, to understand how the crew on board are, 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 are faring and working. Rene, what are, what are your comments on that? I'm just going to bring you in on that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't hear the entire question, but I, I suppose it has to do about crew culture and how we create um, sort of a viable um, atmosphere on board the ship. See, that's also changing. Um, and so um, you'll have a you will have a, a big dislocation in where we normally would would uh, would hire a seafarers from, and 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 that 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 flows now probably as the biggest dislocation ever. Um, so we'll all need to train new uh, um, and encourage new um, sort of um, I suppose countries and regions to to join the fray on on, uh, on being on ships. Um, I think that that is that is how the demography has changed, and maybe it'll swing back um, in the future. I don't know, but we can't use maybe for anything. At the same time, uh, you are changing the landscape of the ship. So um, when I grew up in shipping, uh, you did not have access uh, to the world at home. So you would go on a on a long contract, and um, everything would be well, uh, or it would not, uh, but it would be taken care of. Today, your home is uh, within. Uh, you know, one feet uh, of your hand, which is your mobile phone. And therefore, it creates a completely different psychological um, atmosphere on the ship for good and bad uh, when things are happening. You also see less of, of, of a direct teamwork um, because um, people are, are, of course, like they are when you see them on the street, depending on the mobile phone. So I think we have a huge amount of, of challenges coming coming towards us from figuring out how should ships look in the future? How do we create teamwork? Because it's necessary on a ship, it's a dangerous place if you don't have the right teamwork, if you don't have the right attention. Um, and that is something we can do at scale. There's nobody who has as many seafarers as the gentleman you see in front of you, uh, plus all our other compatriots. And it is incumbent on us to figure that out together with the ship owners. And that comes back to our uh, sort of license to being in shipping is that we can do that across segments. We we are servicing from from a small coastal bunker to an FPSO or a leisure ship. It's completely different, um, you know, aspect of shipping and different aspects of propulsion. And we need to train people, train tra train people for that. Um, and so. Um, therefore, I come back to what you said. What do we expect from a quality ship owner? to manage those complexities, because I can guarantee you it is more and more difficult for shipping companies, uh, even as at scale, to be able to do that. Um, and if we don't put the right investments and convince uh, the, the, the shipping companies, um, it's not difficult to, to, to convince the, re the, the respectable and reputed and mature one, but some of the smaller ones is more difficult uh, to convince that they have to uh, invest in this because they have been used to having a perpetual supply of sea for us. Um, not going to be in the future. I mean, thank you, Rene. And it comes on to that, we've got about 15 minutes left, coming on to that whole point about the human element. And, and this is a concern because, I mean, the ICS are saying 2024 we're going to see a shortage of seafarers. I think there's a, there's also a, a different school of thought that says it's not going to be numbers, it's going to be competence is the key issue here as far as the sort of quality of people that we have. But it also shines a spotlight on this, how are we attracting in 
the talent into the industry for the future, the future proofing of the industry there, getting the right people in, getting that media, the media savvy, getting the technical guys coming in who want to have uh, come into the shipping industry and then go on to shore based uh, jobs on that. Um, is it a worry? Um, Sebastian, you got your hand up. I'm going to chuck that over to you and then open to the floor. Um, just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Over to you, Sebastian. Yeah. Just very briefly towards John and your question. Totally agree. So a ship manager who's not capable of bringing the expertise required to the ship, to the customer will fail. Having said that, coming over to the to the, the human element and what we think or may think be is, is required to attract attract um yeah the existing crew pool, but more importantly, maybe also future generations of, of seafarers into this career. It's it's in my mind, it's a it's a huge challenge. And I think what we probably I speak for for the compatriot ship managers here. What we observe, there is generational differences. Um, so a younger generation um, looks at the job at sea, looks at the potential employers decidedly different than what what older generations or past generations have, have looked at. So currently we look at that in, in the context of, maybe it's worthwhile noting, that how they get paid. So we all know the remittance to the seafarer used to be the thing and it's, it still is you still have to offer that but i'm sure a today 16 18 year old will if you if you ask him for his bank details in in um in manila or, or so at one point they will they will think you're you're outdated so i think we're all challenged to bring a modernized um more up-to-date more current payment solutions um i think the whole esg part and that touches also the general principles um is serves uh, in a, in a way to to make us as employers attractive in 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 the eye of a young potential seafarer uh, just to rounding out the the train of thought we should also not forget the yeah again war and conflict nationality we've all seen um extended conflict um the the, the attitude of the chinese seafarer towards the, the job at at sea change in the context of covid um we um yeah i wouldn't want to extend that yeah. part too much but but leave it at that okay andy can i bring you in on this and i think you know as an owner you know what, what is your thought process as far as when it comes to crew the competence the nationality spread i mean do you do you put a lot of pressure on the managers and say you know i want to know who's going to be on my ships i want to know um you know what level of competence they have are there is there going to be a good cultural mix on board do you want them to sort of operate there in the same way that you you would expect your own shore base? But what is the role of the owner in in that when you're dealing with it with a manager as well? What what was what's on your list of priorities? I think all the points you mentioned, Sean, are baseline requirements, right? We we, we want obviously competent crew, crew that that have the requisite experience in the particular ship that they're that they're crewing. Uh, so I think all, and I, and I think most. Certainly, the team here on this panel deliver that. I, I, that's kind of sort of the, the base requirement of getting into this business is being able to provide that level of, of quality and sophistication. Uh, and just to, to talk about the crew challenge, I think I, I couldn't agree more. It, it's a big issue. I, I know we've been grappling with this issue now for for over a decade, and it's becoming even more, I think significant given what's happening and all the things we've talked about today in terms of decarbonization and new ships and all the changes that are going to be required and as i think about it i mean some of the things that i've seen that i think help are particularly depending on what part of the world you're recruiting crew from is is sort of uh, and again this is nothing new to the gentleman on the panel but you know providing a career path uh embracing the crew's family uh, that could be benefits like health care for the family that's back in whatever country they're from uh i think you know while while they're not at sea finding ways to create continuity and connectivity training and career development opportunities to increase your skill set and, and and really putting one's arms around the crew and, and really saying to them look you're not just somebody on a ship that we take on for six or nine months but that you're part of a family 
we're going to find ways to to help you career develop and grow and and just given the challenges i mean one thing i was at a a session earlier this week uh, with the classification society and, and we haven't talked about cybersecurity, and there probably isn't enough time to talk about it but that one particular issue is is becoming a significant issue that i think all of us are going to have to grapple with and by one measure the global cyber cyber security manpower deficit is, is expected to be almost four million people now that's not just in shipping that's across all industries but if, if I'm a young person and, you know, and I'm trying to develop my career and I can see building skills that perhaps are tangential, but yet relevant to what I'm doing as my primary job, that's going to be very attractive to me. So I think we have to think, uh, I think, as we've said, outside the box and, and provide a real engaging experience for a young person today coming into this business. And that could go in many different directions as they evolve through their career. Really, thank you. Mark, can I bring you in on this? Your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I endorse all of that. I think the, the key here is it's not them and us. And we have to treat our crew uh, as we treat our shore staff as part of the same family and adopt the same sophistication of human resource management as, as we do on the shore staff. We on board our vessels. We have uh, we were talking to uh, some of the newspapers yesterday. We have happiness monitors and everyone starts laughing when we say happiness monitors. But if you have uh, 25 crew on board all recording, two out of five on the happiness scale you've got a problem on board you've not just got a problem you've got a risk to that vessel uh very very interesting we get reports in uh on a monthly basis from our uh well-being provider one care uh that tells us what the crew are worrying about now if you had a if you had a person walking around your office looking concerned you put an arm around them take them into your office and say is everything all right we have to try to extend that arm across the oceans on board our vessels and with whatever digital tools we have and we have that now through our uh uh, hotlines, our mental health hotlines and our happiness indices, et cetera, so that I and, and my uh, senior management team can look on a, a weekly basis and say, what are the issues that concern? I can tell you now, half the crew at the moment are seriously concerned about uh, the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. And is that vessel going to go there? I need to know that so that when a vessel goes there, I can, I can or my team can pick up the phone and assure them that we're doing the risk assessments, that we're looking after their best interest. If there's any risk, we will not uh, uh, authorize the vessel to 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 go through, et cetera, et cetera. We, this is basic person management that we would employ every day ashore, which we have to make sure we employ on board using the technologies that we now have, uh, now have at our uh, disposable, proper human resource management. And with that, the pastoral care that Andy's talking about, so the families are kept updated, so that when they're sitting off the Gulf of Aden, someone is picking up the phone to their family saying, don't worry, we've got your back, your husband or your wife will be will be looked up. This is basic stuff, but we have to extend it to our seafarers. And if you do that, then you'll actually attract people into this industry because fundamentally, what a great industry it is now uh, to come into and all the opportunities that spin off from a life at sea as a young person and then coming ashore and all the, the multitude of different careers that present themselves. And, and, and that's it, it's, it's as simple and straightforward as that. And we will do it. You know, we are doing it. COVID started that process. And I think we're well, all of us here on the panel and, and, and sitting here are well down that road. Uh, Rene, have you got any comments you want to add to that. I think Mark raises a very good point there with regards to the Red Sea as well. You know, the impact you know, these seafarers are sitting on the ships. You know, there's a lot of concern. There must be, you know, is my ship going to be attacked? You know, am I going to be safe? You know, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, thanks. First, first, I think it's an excellent debate. We just had both with Andy and Mark, and I, I do vehemently agree with, with, with what they say. I, I will add that I think, you know, we have a, a, a great amount of well-educated uh, seafarers. And, and, and as you see technology advancing, and I talked about those low-orbit satellites that, that Musk and everybody else is putting up, I, um, I do believe that they should be much more part of the supply chain of how to run uh, and self-serve and, and blah, 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 that, that you can actually do on the, on, on the ships, uh, which will also motivate them. If you have young people coming on board, they will, they will expect that. They, they they will expect that to have a completely different level of sophistication and um, and and you know I'm very much into to the whole augmented reality situation where you where you actually further enhance their ability and when Andy talks about 
the 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 asset being looked after. Well, if you add that element to the to the ship, um, uh, then then you'll have a much better ability to to vet them, uh, to to inspect, and 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 so on and so forth. Where you can do those framework agreements. Um, so I think that's 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 a very exciting way that we are going. On risk, it started um, with the with the Black Sea, didn't it? And um, and and you know um, both from a from a human element perspective, from an insurance perspective, from an asset integrity perspective, and a reputational damage perspective. I mean, the situation right around the corner here is just blow my mind. I mean, it, it's it's um, you know the schoolyard is on fire, and 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 it's a problem. Um, and and um, and we we have been very front footed on that with our clients. Um, we are. Um, we are discussing with them. We are certainly recommending them not to go through, um, and 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 it would be it would be very difficult to convince us otherwise. I would call upon all to to do the same, including charterers, to to think twice because we are putting people in harm's way um, uh, because of of a cargo that, in principle, is a dead cargo, uh, and uh, and therefore uh, um, largely is is a completely different risk uh, risk situation. So. It is a very, very complex, uh, without being geopolitical, situation, and and we should we should go with with um, with belt and braces right now. Um, okay, okay. <clears throat> Mark, can, can I bring you in on this as well as then Andy, just on this whole issue at the Red Sea? You know what your what your thoughts are on that because there's a lot of things involved in this, aren't there? Well, speaking speaking as an ex lawyer, of course, it's uh, I, I take on board exactly what Rene says. But sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, uh, as a manager or or as an owner, to say no, we're not going in because this is uh, whether it is a war or whether it is a hostility uh, uh, carries very different consequences legally. And uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, the business world is harsh and it is cruel and doesn't always allow for those human sensibilities. So the big commodity houses will probably say it's a hostility. We've had two missiles. We haven't seen any pictures of damage. We haven't had any single injury yet. Therefore, go. Uh, and it's very difficult for a manager or a, 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 an owner to say to say no. Um, we we all perform hourly often by the minute, security assessment, risk assessments for each of our vessels waiting to go through the Gulf of Aden and, and onwards. And uh, uh, that risk assessment depends and will vary on the vessel, on its connection with Israel, on its connection with the UK and the US, uh, on its flag, on its previous trading history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A bit like an onion uh, peeling the uh, or adding layers to it until you get to the, uh, the the ridiculous. But that is the context of the risk assessment we do as serious, uh, serious uh, players in the industry. And uh, it, it's not an easy assessment to, to, to make. I think it's far too early at the moment. I, I would suggest to simply say, you know, every vessel cannot go through there, um, albeit that's what we would all like, of course. Andy, have you got any comments? Yeah, I, I, look, uh, it's obviously a, a, a very intense situation. And <clears throat> as Mark said, some charters may have differing views on it. Uh, as far as ourselves, we've been fortunate to have charters that see the same have the same view as we do in the sense that the safety risk outweighs the cargo risk and and we've diverted all vessels with the exception of uh, a few naval convoys that have gone in uh, but uh, without a naval convoy all of our ships are being diverted at this point so uh, and I think that's where the safety thing is not and the safety yeah. issue is critical and and so that from our perspective is the primary driver yeah. for wow. these situations I, I think as soon as you have one injury, the 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 game is a it's a complete game changer. I don't think you know. I think everybody everybody no, everybody here wouldn't argue that uh, you know human life, the safety of human life is paramount. Uh, as soon as you have one industry, the, uh, one injury, the whole thing changes. Um, but and I think even with even with uh, the hardest of the the commercial uh, charters, but uh, yeah, it's a case by case basis still, isn't it? Brilliant. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, we've got a question in from Rolf. Um, 
uh, one of our delegates. Uh, what are you actively doing, ship managers, to lead the way in terms of digitalization? I mean, I think there's a lot happening as far as digitalization is concerned within the in industries, driving an efficiency. Um, who, who on the panel wants to have a? Uh, Mark, or Sebastian, Sebastian, yeah, yeah. Sebastian? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, sustaining, um, I mean, there's almost nothing that, that moves quicker than, than technology currently. Um, it's been with us for um, as a challenge, but also definitely as an opportunity for at least 10 years. But the speed of development now with the introduction of AI is really supercharging the trend. Um, so I think among the panelists here, we all invested heavily into the IT side. Um, for us, just to give a perspective, the, the IT side and the Schulte Group employs 1,000 people by now. 1,000 people. And um, that's what we thought is necessary to, to come up with a, with a good system that we satisfies the requirements of charters and chip owners, our own learn from the gigantic data set, et cetera. But now with AI, and I think we should maybe, maybe uh, make that a, a, the briefest of topics, it's, it'll, be, it'll be a different world. We currently just scratch the surface, obviously in financial analysis on the OPEC side, but also on the Shaw, you can, you can already now, you can, you know, you're not going to be smarter than what your, your best financial analysts can, can produce, the human ones. But AI, as we test it currently, it's just on nonstop. Um, on the, the relatively limited data set because of the security concerns, it's very isolated. But you can see that the speed will go up. Um, maybe as a shout out to the development attempts, we also had a AI self-created tool that looks at um, uh, piston liners, piston crowns. So they, they take the high resolution photographs and it's an AI system that, that tracks the development, makes the recommendation. So AI, the when it's about future proving the industry, the ship mansion industry, I think continues a certain openness and continuous investment in IT is, is, is a big part of it. <laughs> but I think you're right, yeah. Sebastian, it's moving very quickly. But even in the Times today, there's an article that Samsung, as a mobile phone producer, have now, now introduced simultaneous translation as you're talking to somebody on the phone. Not for you. Not Fujitsu, no. In 14 languages, so as you're having this conversation, they're hearing it in Japanese or in Chinese or whatever. I mean, that, that's, and these things are happening all the time. Um, we've come to the end of our one and a half hours. It's, it's amazing. These, these debates, are. I love them. and They're, they're great, and, and uh, the time whizzes by. Um, I would like to ask the audience in front of me and the, the audience behind me and the, the dark curtains of the, uh, of the webinar to thank our panelists today. Um, these debates are very, very good. We can't do it without you. And when you have that good interaction, that good thought leadership that we saw today, it makes certainly my job an awful lot easier. And I think you guys have been brilliant. So if I can just ask everybody and make it a really loud round of applause so they can all hear on here. But thank you very much. <laughs> And, uh, and, and thank you, everybody. Um, as I said, the uh, debate has been recorded, so it will we will um, whiz it onto the InterManager website, onto the SMI website, so you'll be able to enjoy it, and maybe some of your teams can can listen to it. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, Andy and Rene. Thank you very much for for coming in and for your thoughts today, Mark, and for Sebastian. Thank you very much, and uh, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>